often when we think about the story of Noah, we think about the flood, we think about the ark, um, and we think about maybe what happened afterwards, a lot of different things. But one of the things we want to remember that while Noah was preparing the ark, and some say for 120 years, that he was also telling people about God. That it wasn't just that he was building an ark, he was letting people know about the righteousness of God and who God was. I say that to remind us as we head into um, our conclusion of Missions Emphasis Week, that whatever it is that we do specifically within the body of Christ, whatever it is that God calls us to uh, within the body, and God does call us within the body to serve him and to do missions, one of the things that we are always to be about is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just enough to do the work. It's not just enough to go through the motions. It's not just enough to do good things. It is critical that as we serve God, as we serve the church, that we are prepared to and take the opportunity and look for opportunities to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you would turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, I was looking at a book by Tony Evans this week called uh, Theolo- Theology You Can Count On. And in chapter 80 of that book, he has a chapter called Witness of the Church, what it is that the church is supposed to do. And one of the things that he did was he outlined part of this passage. And, and as I was reading that, I really thought it was, a, it, it was an interesting outline, a good outline. And so I borrowed part of that outline, uh, added a little bit to it, changed up little things. But essentially, um, just wanted us to take a look at, as a church that we are called to witness who Christ is, to demonstrate who he is. Paul writes to Timothy, his one that he is mentoring in ministry, uh, one that had been saved through the ministry of Paul. And at the end of chapter 1, Paul is reminding Timothy uh, that he is to engage in the battle, uh, that he is to be consistently engaged in the battle that God has called him to and that he is to do the things that God has called him to. And so we need to be ready to engage in battle, spiritual warfare. And so Paul says this beginning in 1 Timothy chapter 2, God's word says in verse 1. First of all then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed a herald, an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Dear Lord, we do just come before you, praising you. Uh, because you're God, thanking you for your revealed word, the words that you inspired Paul to write. And so, Lord, I pray that we'll take these truths that you have spoken to us and allow our hearts to be shaped and moved by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we realize that all change comes from you. So, Lord, I pray that you would remove me and allow you to be known, allow you to be seen through the truth of your words, that we may be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit for your glory. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. The theme of our passage is that God calls us to pray and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. God calls us to pray and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the first part that we're going to look at is a call for missions, a call for missions. The first thing that we want to do is we want to pray with the right priority, praying with the right priority. Notice how Paul starts this. First of all, so Paul's saying you need to engage in battle, um, and he says at the very beginning of this, what you need to do, first of all, it is the top priority is prayer. I urge you that petitions, uh, some translations say entreaties, Uh, the idea of a petition or an entreaty is something that is a need. So I encourage you to, to, and I urge you to lift up a need uh, for uh, to, to, first of all, petitions and prayers. Prayers are, are basically uh, the idea of being in worship and praying. Intercessions means that we're going to pray for someone else, that we're going to take our time and to, and to pray that God will intervene for someone else. And then finally, uh, thanksgiving. 
Uh, and so this idea of thanksgiving, as Paul reminds the Philippians, is that all things are to go before God with prayer and supplication in the spirit of thanksgiving. So Paul says the first thing you want to do is you want to pray. Pray for needs. Pray in worship. Make sure that you're interceding on others' behalves. And be thankful of what God's done for you. And thankful of what we have the opportunity to do. The absolute foundation of all that we do as a church, all that we do as individuals, is prayer. Jerry Falwell used to say that the only failure was a prayer failure. If we want to do what it is that God has called us to do, if we want to be the people that God desires us to be, at the very heart of that is going to be prayer. We can do the best programs in the world, we can reach people in the, the, the most innovative ways, but it doesn't matter what we do, if behind that and holding that up and primarily we spend time in prayer. It's one of the reasons that we had the focus we had last week as we went through All In with Mark Batterson was this idea that we would come together and pray. And I would encourage you, now not today because we don't have any activities this, tonight because of the Heart of Missions Banquet, but next week at 515, if you have the opportunity and you're going to be here on Sunday night, I'd encourage you to come early as we gather and just pray. Because I really believe, whether it's corporately at 515 on Sunday or, or on Sunday morning or at some point in time, that if we as a church are not consistently engaged in prayer as individuals and together, God will not move in this body. God doesn't move when there is not prayer. It doesn't mean that he can't, but God chooses to use those that pray. And so Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, he's saying, first of all, pray. Pray for one another. So praying with the right priority. Praying for the right people. Praying for the right people. Notice who we're to pray for. Prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Now, that seems pretty generic that we should pray for everyone. And I suspect if somebody asked you, they said, do you want everyone to go to heaven? Our first response would be, yeah, I want to see everyone go to heaven. But do we take time to pray for everyone? Do we take time to pray for people? What about the guys that are involved in ISIS? Is my heart to see them die so that they can be sent to the hell that they deserve? Or do I want to pray that those guys come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? What about the rapist? What about the murderer? Do I want to see them be killed? Or do I want to see them come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? See, when Scripture tells us to pray for everyone, it doesn't in parentheses say the easy people. We should pray for our family. We should pray for our friends. We should pray for those people that for whatever reason we just have an affection for. And, and that's good, and we should do that. But make no mistake, we need to have a heart for everyone. We need to have a heart for all that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter if it's a militant dictator in North Korea. We should pray for everyone's salvation. Because here's the deal. No matter who you think of in human history or that's alive today, no matter how vile or offensive you think that person is, by the way, just as an aside, Monday night, I realized how old I was getting because I led my devotion with a story about Charles Manson and everybody in there went and had no idea who he was. So now, this crowd gets that. I would never use that in the early service because I'd just get blank stares again. But I, I was trying to about Charles Manson. And if you remember Charles Manson, how, I mean, he's still alive. How hard is it to pray for Charles Manson? But here's the thing. Jesus Christ died for Charles Manson the very same way he died for me the very same way he died for you. Jesus died that all may be forgiven of their sins. We'll see that pointed out again later in this passage, but we are to pray for everyone. So we pray with the right priority. We pray with the right, for the right people. We pray for the right conditions. We pray for the right conditions. So pray for everyone. Pray for kings. 
in all those in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all goodness and dignity. We pray for our leaders of our country. Whether we like that leader or don't like that leader, we are to pray that they will give us an opportunity and that through by praying for our kings, for the leaders, the presidents, for our, our leaders, so that we may have tranquil and quiet life and all godliness and dignity. Now, I was refereeing some yesterday and got home and ate supper. I didn't watch any news until the debate came on last night and found out that Judge Antonin Scalia died. Now, I, I try to avoid politics, but I will say this. The court, the Supreme Court, on whoever the next justice is and whoever appoints it, will help to shape our country in a dramatic way. And if the right person is appointed to court and they say that they're going to limit religious freedoms to where a church cannot speak the gospel because it's a hate crime. And there are cities and counties where people are issuing ordinances to say the proclamation of the gospel is a hate crime because we say there is only one way to heaven. If that ever got approved, then it would be much more difficult for us to proclaim the gospel in an open fashion the way that we do on Sunday morning. Pray for the leaders of our country whether you like them or not, that we may live peaceably and tranquilly so that we will proclaim the gospel. Now, I will tell you, it's nearly easy to get fired up on the first part of that and say, yeah, we need leaders to make sure that we've got that right, and we, we should pray for that, absolutely. But don't miss the second half of that. It's so that there is peace and tranquility so that we can do what God calls us to do. And I would argue that the majority of us, including me, on Sunday morning when they get ready to come to church don't realize the blessing that God has given us to worship Him in public. That we don't consistently thank God that in our country that I can go to work and that I can go to the store and I have the opportunity to engage someone in a conversation and share about Jesus Christ. And we throw away that opportunity daily. So before we get too fired up about our leadership, it does our leadership no good to provide us that opportunity if we ignore our responsibility on the back end. But make no mistake, we should be praying that we can live in godliness and in dignity and in tranquility and in quiet so that we have the opportunity to share the gospel. We need to make sure that we pray with the right priority that we pray for the right people, that we pray for the right conditions. Prayer is at the heart of everything that we do. Prayer was at the heart of what Jesus did. Think back to Jesus' ministry. He's about 30 years old, it tells us in Scripture, and what's the first thing he does? He gets baptized. What does Jesus immediately do? do remember what he does after he gets baptized? He goes off into the wilderness for 40 days to pray and fast. Jesus who was God, fully human, but fully God, knew that he needed to pray. It says that uh, Jesus was tempted in the way that we're tempted. The power that Jesus had come from God because Jesus, as a human, prayed. There's a great story early in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus goes to the Sabbath that morning. He comes back that afternoon. He's healing people. That's where they drop the guy from the, the rooftop. The four friends drop their friend down because the house was so crowded because Jesus is healing all those people. And so it'd be really easy the next morning to do what? Man, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep in. You know what Scripture says Jesus did? That he got up early in the morning and went out by himself to pray. Because Jesus realized it was important that he took time to pray. Several occasions, Jesus is teaching with the crowds or healing the crowds or working with the crowds. And it says he sent the disciples on ahead and that he would go up to the mountain and pray. We get to the last night of Jesus' life. What does Jesus do? Before he's arrested, before he's hung on the cross, before one of his 12 closest followers betrays him to turn him over to his death, Jesus goes and prays. By the way, what did the disciples do? Peter, James, and John, his three main disciples, what did they do? They fell asleep. We don't want to be Peter, James, and John. We want to be praying with Christ. 
And that's why he was able to go and take the physical punishment and the spiritual torture that he received on our behalf. Because Jesus Christ prayed. By the way, don't think it was easy for Jesus. He sweated as if drops of blood. If Jesus didn't spend the beginning of his ministry in prayer, continually in prayer, I don't know that he would have ever been ready at the end of his life for what God had prepared him to do. Prayer is the foundation for all that we do as believers and in proclaiming the gospel. In the book of Colossians, Paul writes this in chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message to speak the mystery of the Messiah, for which I'm in prison. So devote yourself to prayer. Stay alert in your prayer with thanksgiving. And then pray for us, an intercession on Paul's behalf. And Paul's not saying, by the way, in this prayer, notice he doesn't say, get me out of prison. He says, pray for us that God may open a door to us for the message to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison. I'm in prison, don't pray to get me out, pray that where I'm at I'll have the chance to share the gospel and that I'll have a chance to reveal the ministry of the Messiah, the mystery of the Messiah. So that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Speak in a way that honors God and glorifies God. The people know that you're a believer so that the door may be open. But pray for the opportunity to share the gospel. Pray for us. A call to pray for missions. A call to proclaim the gospel. A call to proclaim the gospel. Verse 3. Three and four tell us that proclamation pleases God. Proclamation pleases God. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Everyone to be saved. This goes back to what we've talked about before. No matter how evil or vile or we think someone is, it is God's desire that everyone come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and come to the knowledge of the truth. When we proclaim the gospel, it pleases God. When God uses us, we are the body on earth. We are the body of Christ. It is us, our responsibility to proclaim the gospel. And when we do that, it pleases God. And so we want to proclaim the the gospel to please God. Proclamation points to God. Proclamation points to God. As we proclaim the gospel, it is never about us. It is never about who we are. We can share what God's done for us for his glory, but sharing the gospel is always about pointing people to Jesus Christ. In verse 5, there is one God. Make no mistake, there is one God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are no multitude of gods to choose from. Any other God is a creation of man's mind. We can make things a God. We can place them as the top in our life. But there is one God. And so that's what Paul's reminding Timothy of. There is one God. Also, there is one mediator between God and humanity. See, because of our fallen nature, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there is no way that we on our own can be in the presence and dwell in heaven and be with God because the wages of our sin is death. And so the only way that we can receive salvation, the only way that we can be called into a relationship with God, the only way that we can spend eternity in heaven, the only way that we can walk under the power of Christ here in this world through the power of the Holy Spirit is for somebody to bridge the gap between us and God. And so he immediately says, okay, there's one God, but then there is one mediator between God and humanity, Jesus Christ himself, human. Jesus Christ, fully God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ was fully human. He got tired. He got hungry, 
He cried. Jesus was human. He was fully human. And it's because he was fully human, it's because he is fully God, that he is able to bridge the, bridge the gap between the two and that we can have a mediator that allows us access to God the Father that we may receive salvation. He gave himself. Gave himself. See, he may have been portrayed in the, Israel, in, the, in the Sanhedrin, may have said they put him to death, and the Romans may have thought they put him to death, but make no mistake, the only reason Jesus died is because Jesus wanted to die, and he allowed it to happen. He gave himself a ransom for all, a ransom for all. We tend to think of a ransom as being pay the kidnapper, pay the bad guy. It literally means to pay a price so that someone can be set free. But make no mistake, when Jesus Christ paid a ransom, he didn't pay it to a bad guy. He didn't pay a ransom to Satan. Satan had no authority on Jesus, nothing he could do. He paid a payment to God so that we could be set free. So that we could be free, see, freed from the bondage of sin that we've placed on ourselves. So Jesus paid a price. He paid a ransom so that we could be saved. A testimony at the proper time see that was God's plan from the beginning that he was going to send Jesus Christ and be saved I was watching one of those History Channel National Geographic things that that talk about Christianity and uh, they come on a lot of times around Easter or Christmas and I don't watch them anymore because I get mad and I was watching one of them one time and it said you know Christianity really got lucky that if you were going to take the entire expanse of time that we know of today that the absolute perfect time to start a religion was at the time that Jesus Christ was here. You had the Roman roads that made travel easier to get back and forth to spread your message. You had peace from the Romans, so it was easier to travel because there wasn't as many ongoing wars and that type thing. And if you look, there, there wasn't as many ways to communicate. And if you look at all of time, the absolute best time to start a religion was then. Christianity just got lucky. Now, I will give those guys credit that they could look back from our time period and look back to where they believe time began, and they realized that the absolute best time to start a religion and the best time to send a Savior to this world was at the time that Jesus Christ came. But God knew that in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth. Jesus came at the proper time as our Savior. We need to understand that the message points to God. Finally, it proclamation pursues God. Proclamation pursues God. It pursues who we are with Him. It pursues the mission that He has given us. Paul concludes, For this I was appointed a herald. This message, this ministry, this gospel, I was appointed a herald, someone to speak it. An apostle, an apostle is someone that, that saw Jesus directly. Our, our New Testament books, they have to have apostolic authority, uh, belief in the apostles that sued Christ, knew Christ. And Paul says, I'm an apostle. He saw Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the fact he saw Christ out of time because he saw him on the road to Damascus. But he saw Jesus. He goes, I was an apostle. I'm telling the truth, not lying. And a teacher to the Gentiles in faith and truth. My job was to share with the Gentiles the message of Jesus Christ. He goes, that was my calling. That's what I was supposed to do. I want to tell you that if we are part of the body of Christ, God has given us a ministry. God has given us a mission. And God has given us a call on our life. Not necessarily to be a pastor. Every one of us, though, has a call to proclaim the gospel. See, if I go back, it, 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 we, we've got to make sure that we stay focused on proclaiming the gospel. It has to be the overriding purpose of everything that we do. That is why God brings us into the body. It's for his glory that we can be the body of Christ on earth and share gospel with others. Help others grow in their faith with Christ. That is our purpose. That is our call. It can be done in different ways. Paul is a preacher of the Gentiles, but we have one specific purpose and our job is to wake up and figure out what it is we're supposed to do. Now, I am not a Tom Brady fan on any level. But here's the thing about Tom Brady. He hired a, a, a chef several years ago for him and his wife. He is absolutely freakish about what he allows to enter his body. Specific ingredients he will eat, he won't eat. 
he won't drink a beer because, during the season especially because he's scared that that somehow may mess up the chemical balance in his body and hurt him throwing a pass on Sunday. Now, we might think that's nuts. But every, every single thing he does in his life with his sleep pattern, with his preparation, everything he does is focused on being a quarterback because what matters to him in his life is being the absolute best quarterback possible. The question for us is, do we stay focused on being what it is that God calls us to do? Or do we get distracted? It's easy to get distracted and miss what it is that God has called us to do. Ultimately, God has called us to make disciples. That, that's, that's what, I may not know always especially what I'm supposed to do, but I know that when in doubt, my job is to do something to make a disciple. Is to do something to help someone grow. And the Great Commission that they, think of, they sang about earlier. Remember how it starts. We always want to start with therefore go. No, go back a verse so you know why they're saying therefore. Jesus says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So I have all the authority in the world, seen and unseen. And because I have that authority, therefore you, my disciples, those that believe in me, go. Now understand, going is a participle, it's not the main command. Going supplements the main command, we'll get to that in a second. But make no mistake, we have to be intentional. It has to be a focus of what we do. Remember the story of Abraham? God calls him and says, go to a land that I'm going to show you. It says the next morning Abraham got up, and where did he go? He said, okay, I'm going to Palestine, let me start. No, he got up and he went and followed the direction that God was going to take him, not knowing the land. See, I don't always know where I'm going to end up. I don't always know the ministry that God may call me to 10 years down the road or five years down the road or five months down the road. What I know is that when I wake up in the morning, I want to go to the land that God's calling me to. I want to go and do what God's calling me to do. I want to be intentional about what God has commanded me to do. And that's the next word, make disciples. That is ultimately what we are called to do is to make disciples. By being intentional, and there's two parts to making a disciple. There's three participles. One is to be intentional, going. The last two, baptizing, which speaks to evangelism. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to proclaim the gospel so that people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Not the pastor. Not the associate pastor. We're not excluded, but we're not the only ones that are supposed to. Everyone that is a follower of Jesus Christ is instructed and commanded by Jesus Christ in his last instructions. All authority has been given to me that therefore go be intentional and make disciples. That is the purpose for which we were created. We may not always know exactly what we're going to do, but we need to get up in the morning like Abraham did and go forward doing something to make disciples. Baptizing those that don't know Jesus Christ coming to salvation teaching them, and by the way, not just teaching them, notice what it says, teaching them to obey all the things that I have commanded you. See, that's how we grow. We go through obedience. We go grow by demonstrating that our life is completely surrendered to Christ. Baptizing new believers, teaching those that know Christ to obey all the things that God has taught us. All the things that I have spoken to you. That's, part, that's what we're called to do. That's the entire focus of our life. If I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, then I'm going to obey. I want to do what's pleasing to God. I want to do what he's called me to do. I will make disciples. It is the absolute priority. And by the way, just in case we're in any doubt that this is all about Jesus and about he's going to do the work, he concludes the Great Commission by at the very end by saying, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All authority has been given to me. I'm with you to the end of the age. Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing and teaching to obey. That's our purpose. That is what God has called us to do. It's a call to proclaim the gospel, teaching others. I just want to point out real quick, by the way, next Sunday night, we're going to start a series on who is God. Now, you might think, I know who God is. But I really believe that the more we see God high and lifted up, 
the more that we understand the greatness, the holiness, the majesty, and the power of God, that our lives will change. We have weak follow-through on what we do sometimes because we have a weak vision of who God is. And so starting on Sunday nights next week, we're going to be doing, going through, looking at who God is is Wednesday night, by the way, this week, we're going to start a series on 1 Corinthians. That'll be followed by a series on 2 Corinthians. Um, that church was messed up. They had a lot of issues. And so it's a great way to look in a messed up society how it is that we can turn to God to change us, grow us, and be the people that God calls us to be, teaching and learning about who God is. We have a call to pray for missions, a call to proclaim the gospel for our application. How does it, what does it mean for us today? First of all, we are to respond to God's call for salvation. We are to respond to God's call for salvation. Until we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, there is nothing we can do. It doesn't mean that we've been baptized. It doesn't mean that we're a church member. It means that there is a point in our life where we have absolutely surrendered to the message of Jesus Christ, that we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, and that we have surrendered our life and that we desire to confess our sins to be in his place with holiness. There is a, we have to first respond to God's call for salvation. Next, we need to respond to God's call for prayer. We need to respond to God's call for prayer. We need to have a prayer list of people that we are praying for, for salvation. We, we have some on our bulletin, uh, but there aren't a whole lot. Um, but we need to have people that we are specifically praying for their salvation. We need to have people that we are praying that God's going to give us an opportunity to share the gospel. Now, that scares us sometimes because we, well, I may not do it right. You know what? You don't have to do it right. You know why? Because all authority has been given to Jesus Christ and he's going to be with you to the end of the age and he's the one that's going to save them anyway. God doesn't need you to be perfect. He needs you to be willing. We need to make sure that we pray so that we can be used by God. We have to pray so that God will move in our life. We need to pray for individuals. We need to pray not just for those to be saved, we need to pray for people that do know Jesus, but we know aren't walking with him. It may be that there's a sin in their life. It may be that they haven't been to church in 10 years. It may be that they've got something that they're, they're, they may be bad about something. That's why they're not coming. It doesn't matter why you're not coming. If you're not consistently worshiping God as part of the body, your relationship with God cannot be right. It's part of who we are. And so we need to be praying for those people different people in each of our lives that we should be praying for. We, again, we should pray for people to be healed physically, but I want to tell you, we better start praying for people to be healed spiritually if we want to see God move. The power of prayer ignites it, and we need to respond to that call of praying first of all. Respond to God's call for proclaiming the gospel. We must respond to God's call for proclaiming the gospel. Again, it's not just my job to proclaim the gospel. It is not just Brian's job to proclaim the gospel. It is every believer. Doesn't mean you have to do it in public. Doesn't mean you do it in front of people. It does mean that God's going to put people in your life if you're looking for the opportunity to share the gospel. God's not going to tell you to proclaim the gospel and not give you the ability to do it. Here's the other little secret about that. God's not going to call you to proclaim the gospel and not give you an opportunity to do it. God's not going to tell you to do something you can't do. He's going to give you the power. And he's going to give you the opportunity. The question is, am I willing to be surrendered enough that I will respond to that call? Do I genuinely, do I genuinely have a heart to see people get saved? It's easy to say I want to see people get saved. But am I genuinely concerned enough and have a heart to where it changes my actions so that people will come to know Jesus Christ or again, that they will grow in their walk with him? What am I willing to do to see people to come to know Christ? Now see, I really believe that as a church, there's really only three things that we need to do. They're big things, but there's really only three. We need to provide people an opportunity to worship. That, that, that's what we're here for. We, we voted this past week. We are going to modify the schedule um, beginning Easter Sunday. 
9 o'clock worship in the rock, 10 o'clock Bible study for everybody, 11 o'clock worship in here like we're doing this morning. We as a church need to provide an opportunity for worship. We as an oppor- a church need to provide an opportunity for you to grow in your walk with Christ through Bible study and through building relationships with others, and that's why we have Bible study, Sunday school, whatever name you want to call it, small group, whatever you call it. There needs to be groups building each other up, and our job is to offer that opportunity. I can't make anybody go to a Sunday school class. Hurts me when I know people consistently skip Sunday school. Hurts me when I know people consistently skip worship because I know they're not walking with God the way that they need to. I don't need any other evidence than that. The third thing we're to do is to help people find their ministry. To help people find where it is that they're supposed to work so that people can come to know Jesus Christ. See, that's why we do stuff like the backpack buddies and we do the shoe boxes. We do those as a way to demonstrate the love of Christ with the hope that through that, the gospel of Jesus Christ will be shared. It's not about the food. It's not about the gifts. It's not about somebody just having a Christmas gift. It's about the opportunity that someone can take that Christmas gift and come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. WMU, Soul Sisters, Baptist Men. It doesn't matter which of those groups you're involved with, you're involved with one of those groups. The purpose of those groups is to find ways for the gospel to be spread, for to build each other up, to draw closer to God. That's the purpose. And if we lose sight of that and we make it anything else, then it's not as important as it could be going on mission trips. I mean, I'd love to take a big group out to Montana. I would love for us to have a huge group go out there. Why do we go? If we're going out there because it's a beautiful place, if we're going out there because I've never been on a mission trip, if I'm going out there just because I'm trying to do something for me, then I've lost the purpose. The reason I go to Montana, the reason we've gone to Richmond, the reason we've gone to Bluefield, Virginia, the reason we've gone overseas is so that the gospel can be proclaimed and the believers can be built. So that we can grow because we've been called. Jesus also said in Acts 1.8 that when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. It's why we are called to share the gospel. It's why some are called to preach. But all of the trips are designed to proclaim God. Why do we do drama? Because we want to be entertained on a Saturday night? Because it's cute to do that on two Saturday mornings before Christmas to do breakfast in Bethlehem and it makes us feel good? No. Why do we do upward basketball? Because we've got 125 plus kids over there on Saturday morning and it makes us feel good about ourselves? No. The purpose of all of that is to help people grow in their walk with Christ and to know who Jesus Christ is. And if we ever do any of those things for any other reason, then it's foolhardy. And it will not be blessed by God. How about Vacation Bible School? We love Vacation Bible School. A lot of people got saved in Vacation Bible School that grew up in the church. If we ever lose sight of the fact that we're trying to lead kids to Christ and those that know Christ to walk better with God, if we ever lose sight of what we're actually there for, it's not about the games, it's not about the decorations, it's not about the food, it's not about anything else, but making sure people know Jesus Christ and that they become disciples. That... To quote an expression I normally hate, but this time it's true. That is what it's all about. What about my personal life? What about playing golf? Working. Being a teacher. Coaching basketball, baseball. Doing music. The purpose of everything I do with my life is how can I use that gift, that passion, that talent to help people become a disciple? If I play golf, I need to be prepared to share with whoever I play with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I coach baseball, basketball, I need to model that. If I teach music, people need to know I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When I work, people need to know what I stand for. People need to know that Jesus Christ has had an impact on my life and I need to be praying and I need to be proclaiming that gospel in all that I do. We have the opportunity 
We're getting ready to have a lunch. We're going to look at other opportunities within the church. And I, by the way, never limit yourself to what's already in place. It may be that there's something else God's calling you to do, and we as a church need to support that. But understand, we are to be about building the kingdom above all else through prayer and the proclamation of the gospel. I'm his gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray indeed that in this moment that you'll move. That if there is someone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that indeed your spirit will fall on them in such a way, call them in such a way that they will not be able to resist and that they'll surrender themselves to you. Lord, not about church membership, not about baptism, but having a genuine change in life where the power of the Holy Spirit enters us and our life is changed. Oh God, I pray that you'd move today. Someone here doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, but Lord, I also pray for those that know you. Oh God, give us a passion for prayer to make disciples. To pray individually, to pray together. Oh God, give us a heart for prayer the way your son did when he walked on this earth. God, give us a vision of what it is every day you want us to do, what you want us to do over the long term that people may come to know you as Lord and Savior and grow in their faith. Oh God, help us to have a heart and a passion and the desire to make disciples because you have all authority and you've given us your spirit and the power that comes with it. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.